Hey, good afternoon, everybody. This is Mayor Randall Woodfin. I am here with the representative, city council representative of District 5, Dr. Daryl O'Quinn. Um, what we want to do today is um, have a virtual town hall meeting. As you know, the, the health crisis and the pandemic coronavirus um, is preventing us from meeting in public in large gatherings. Um, however, uh, we thought it would be best to still find a way to communicate to the residents of District 5 and share important information with you as it relates to uh, some of the basic services we continue to provide to your district and neighborhoods in District 5, as well as some other concerns you have. And so what we'll do today um, is give updates, and then we'll get into some questions um, and answers. And with that, i turn it over to Dr. O'Quinn for an introduction. Good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here with Mayor Woodfin. Um, we look forward to sharing some very useful information with you about um, various things that I know you're concerned about throughout the district. And then also we'll take an opportunity to look at some of the questions that you've been sending in uh, and hopefully give you some, some answers to those questions. So, um, uh, Dr. O'Quinn is, is putting it back to me. Uh, I'll jump right in. As many of you all know, uh, District 5 uh, um, is, is a very interesting geograph geographically shaped district. It not only touches the central city of the city of Birmingham, but it touches portions of, of north, east, and south. And so I want to start with the community resource representatives. As you know, prior to the COVID-19, during your monthly meetings, um, there were neighborhood meetings on a monthly basis where community um, resource officers and representatives from the city of Birmingham engaged the neighbor the neighborhood association, engaged the neighborhood leaders, and engaged the actual residents of each neighborhood in District 5. Um, as you see here, the names were Jasmine Fell, Herman Lumsey, and Andre Washington, as well as Harold Houston and Melanie Martin. They do a great job as well. And so we'll jump in. Um, one of the biggest things we know across the city has been blight. And so we want to jump into some updates on what have we done in District 5 around demolition. Um, structures demolished in District 5 since January 1 of 2018 um, have been 121. 121 um, properties that have beyond repair have been demolished. Of those, 114 were contracted out by the city and seven were private um, demo. Um, in addition to that, um, there are 48 structures. 48 structures have been deemed condemned separate from those that I just mentioned and have been identified for demolition in the following um, neighborhoods. You have two in Brown Springs, four in College Hills, five in Crestwood North, six in Druid Hills, six in East Lake, six in Fountain Heights, one in Gate City, three in Oak Ridge Park, seven in Smithfield, one in Southside and seven in Wyoming. Um, as we move um, through the various updates, we now want to talk about zoning enforcement cases. Um, I know zoning is a big deal, not just in District 5, but around the city. But as it relates to District 5, um, active zoning enforcement cases, there are a total of 40. 40 active zoning 40, um, enforcement cases with nine closed out in District 5. Um, just an FYI, this includes violations such as business use of residential property, outside storage, home occupation violations, fence violations, and some inoperable vehicle cases. These are the things that what we define as simply as a no-no and you shouldn't be doing in your neighborhood. And so those are there are 40 active cases currently in District 5 that we're working on. Moving to the next topic, we want to talk about the housing code enforcement violations. So as it relates to housing code enforcement violations, the number is 1585. There are 1,585 housing code inspections conducted in District 5 since January 2019. Um, that's right at about one year and four months. These include properties reported to be in violation of the city's property maintenance code that include violations such as deteriorated roof systems, damaged windows, chip exterior paint, damaged or deteriorated, um, and inadequate utility service. Um, these are the things 
that our um, our employees have been hard at in District 5 aggressively attacking um, every day, every week in District 5 for over the last year. Moving to the next topic, and um, Councilor Quinn, feel free to jump in at any time. Sure. Um, if you have any thoughts on any of these topics. Moving to the next uh, update, it is around critical repair applications. So as many of you all know, the Community Development Department, um, they have um, a program um, for um, critical repair grants. So overall, across the entire city, uh, this is spread out through all nine districts. In District 5, there are 17. 17 critical repair applications have been approved by the Community Development Department during the 2019 cycle within uh, District 5. It includes one in Brown Springs, two in College Hills, one in Druid Hills, four in East Lake, two in North Birmingham, four in Norwood, two in Smithfield Estates, and one in Woodlawn. The average cost for a critical repair grant per home um, is about $10,500. The smallest amount is $2,100 and the maximum amount is $15,000. Mayor Woodfin, um, yes. just to explain a little bit about what this critical repair grant um, is, is, is for um, folks who have a home, um, mostly seniors that are on a fixed income, uh, they, you can apply for funding through the city. Uh, we receive federal housing and urban development grant dollars. Um, these are what they call CDBG or um, Community Development Block Grant funds. And a portion of those funds are allocated for these critical repairs and are intended to um, be used for things like roofs and um, other critical infrastructure of a home so that the homeowner can stay in the home. And as was pointed out in the slide, um, these the cost of these repairs uh, can be significant in some cases. So um, just know that if you are aware of someone in your neighborhood or maybe you yourself are in need of uh, critical repairs to your home, but you have financial challenges, this is something that is available through the city of Birmingham that you can apply for. Thanks, Darrell. That update is um, definitely needed and, and can give some color to uh, the whole critical repair grant process and uh, participation in it. Uh, moving to the next topic, we want to talk about illegal dumping. As many of you all know, we have the Don't Be a Dummy campaign. Uh, we believe it's been successful in some parts of town, but the truth is this, we would like to see it be more. So we should be frank with each other. I've noticed a lot of uh, um, telling, sharing, calling our office, calling police, um, and people don't see people wearing facial covers. Um, I hope you keep the same type of energy when you see people illegally dumping or littering or committing any other crimes in our city, whether they are misdemeanors or warrants. So we need you to be active and report out, call if you see someone illegally dumping. But as it relates to District 5, 66 is the number. Uh, there are currently 66 cases of illegal dumping um, that have been resolved since January of 2019. Um, we know there's more dumping than that, so please help us out. If you see it, report it. If you see someone actively doing doing it, remember to use your cell phone and technology. Uh, take pictures, record, and you can bring it down to our magistrate's office. Um, I do want to share this. Please do not engage the person if you see someone illegally dumping. Just gather the information and bring it to us. We'll do the rest. Um, the next topic we want to discuss is weed abatement. We know that there are a lot of overgrown lots throughout our city. And so just to give some information, um, since January 1 of 2018, so a little over two years, in about four months, uh, we've cleared 2,000 plus lots have been cut or cleaned. 701 of those have been vacant lots cut by a contractor and about 1,300 um, have been cut by the owner or our city staff. Um, there are currently 758 properties active in the weed bill for District 5. Again, that number is 738. These are properties that are either waiting to be cut um, or put on a contractor's list or still being processed. 
Hey, Mayor Wickland, again, I yeah. uh, uh, wanted just to add a little bit of more information here. So um, these are privately owned lots um, and the city of Birmingham cannot send our employees onto those lots uh, without going through a legal process that we in-house refer to as the weed bill. So if you look at the council agenda, week in, week out, we have hundreds of properties that are listed um, as in a portion of this weed bill process. Um, and that is a process that we have to go through um, to get the legal permission to send our employees onto those properties and, and cut the cut the lot. So it's, it's not as easy as some folks might like. Um, you can't just call the city, we can't just run out and cut the lot. We actually have to go through a legal process in order to uh, legally go onto that property and, and cut it and make sure that our employees are, are covered adequately. Thanks, Daryl. So let's move to a topic that uh, I'm pretty sure Dr. O'Quinn offers to get as many calls as I get, and that is potholes. Uh, I want you all to know that uh, we actually have a pothole crew who's responsible on a daily, weekly, monthly, and yearly basis addressing and repairing and patching potholes. Um, you should know, but if you didn't know, um, that probably on a, a weekly basis, um, they patch and repair probably over 200 potholes on a weekly basis. So that's a lot of work. So just in District 5, 1,370, that's 1,370 potholes been, have been repaired over the last year, just alone in District 5. Again, there's also pothole repair and patching. Uh, that's about 2,000, that's probably close to 3,000 um, feet of patches have been completed in District 5 over the last year as well. Still on the topic of potholes, re potholes repair and patching, uh, the following locations I'm not going to read every one of them to you, but um, there are many locations that have been been or will be patched in District 5 for the fiscal year of the 2019 contract. So you see a lot of areas on 2nd Avenue South, a lot of areas on Richard Arrington Boulevard, um, some areas on Oporto Madrid. By the way, I'll get to Oporto Madrid in a minute because I know it's of concern to a lot of folk. And the 1st Avenue South area. So moving from potholes as it relates to repair and, and patching. Now let's move to street resurfacing projects. Uh, for District 5, so there's a five-year plan and I'm pretty sure Dr. O'Quinn can give you some little bit more uh, color and detail to what I'm about to say, so I'll do high level. Uh, there's a five-year, is it 10-year or five-year? It's the, what's, or we <laughs> aspire to a five-year uh, plan. Yeah. yeah. We aspire to a five-year plan to pave streets throughout the entire city of Birmingham. Um, those streets are put on a list based on um, the worst, the, the worst um, driven streets or the streets that need the most help need repair. So in District 5, there are about 2.8 miles of street segments this fiscal year and probably about 876,000 plus in investment in street resurfacing segments. And so the following street segments were uh, were to be completed in District 5 um, this fiscal year, and I'll name some of them. You have 39th Street South from 1st Ave um, to 5th Avenue South. You have 30th Street from 5th, 5th Avenue to 3rd Avenue. You have 1st Avenue South Side Street from 34th Street to 35th Street. You also have Crystal Hill Lane from Higdon to South End and Crystal Hill Way from Higdon to South End. In addition to that, you have 5th Avenue South from 55th Street to 56th Street. Hey, that sounds familiar. Yeah, that's yeah. right. I you, also, that one. <laughs> yeah. you also have 68th Street South from 1st Avenue North to Higdon Road, Dublin Ave from Higdon Road to Kentucky Ave, 5th Ave South from 56th to 61st Street South, 65th Street North from 1st Ave to 4th Ave North, and 4th Avenue South from 36th Street to 41st Street South. Daryl, is there anything you want to add to that? Yeah, you know, we um, definitely appreciate the paving that has been done. And again, um, 
the five year plan uh, was really aspirational whenever it was proposed. Um, coming into office, there was that proposal for the five year plan um, to put $10 million towards paving each, each year for five years uh, to put us on a tra trajectory to repave all of the streets that need to be repaved in the city of Birmingham. However, coming into office, that funding had, had not been put in place. So it's been the task of this administration, this council, um, to try and make that happen as, as much as we are able. And so for the, the past uh, three years now, we have been allocating as much funding as we can possibly uh, squeeze out of the budget towards street resurfacing. And this past uh, fiscal year, or the fiscal year that we're in currently, I believe was about $8 million that we put towards street resurfacing. We need to find a way to get the 10, man. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks. So yeah. again, we aspire to that five-year plan. It's probably gonna be more along the lines of a, a seven or eight year plan. Um, but our task before us is to resurface all those streets that need resurfacing. Yes, sir. So, um, on, on, on that note, we should continue on street resurfacing projects. And the number is two numbers. One is 3.4 miles. What we are going to do is have 3.4 mile street segments for next fiscal year. That's a price tag of about 1.8, close to $1.9 million in investment. And the following street segments will be will be completed in District 5 next fiscal year. They include, and and this is going to be everybody's favorite, a Porto Madrid Boulevard from 1st Avenue North to 68th Place South. In addition to that, it's 5th Avenue South from, Steve, from um, Stevens Expressway to 34th Street South, 32nd Street from 2nd Ave North to 3rd Avenue South, Shuttlesworth Drive from 12th Avenue North to 19th Avenue North and 6th Avenue South um, from the expressway to 28th Street South. So, Daryl, uh, anything you want to talk about about a Porto Madrid? Uh, well, you know, um, <laughs> it is in pretty tough shape and um, I definitely feel for anybody who has to travel that road on a daily basis. Um, our street crews out are have been out there uh, filling the potholes. Um, the problem with those patches is that uh, given the weather, you know, the, the patches um, don't last very long. And, you know, especially on a port of Madrid where there's a lot of, a lot of traffic, a lot of traffic volume. So um, I know everyone uh, is looking forward to that street repair. It's something that my office has been hearing about um, since we got here. So uh, definitely uh, looking forward to that and um, the other uh, forthcoming paving that was also mentioned. Look, um, can't say enough. We're all excited about a Porto Madrid. So as we move from potholes to paving streets, we now want to talk about sidewalks because all of this is related to our city's infrastructure. Uh, in District 5, we have one mile and, and 173 ramps. Um, for sidewalks in, in this fiscal year. That's about a close to $471,000 investment. In addition to that, uh, around sidewalk projects, um, coming up we have 5.7 miles and about 264 ramps of sidewalk projects in District 5. Um, that's about a total of a $1.6 million investment in repairing and making sure our sidewalks are walkable in District 5. Darryl, yeah. is there anything you want to add about sidewalks? Yeah, so, you know, the thing that I'll say is that we, we have developed a sidewalk master plan for the city of Birmingham. And um, as part of that project, uh, every inch of sidewalk in the city of Birmingham would have, was walked and all of the uh, repair issues documented. Every place that there's a tree root pushing up the sidewalk, um, cracks, you name it, um, that has all been documented. Well, when you look at the whole picture in total, uh, it's pretty overwhelming how much repair is needed, and that's due to the fact that 
Um, for decades, really, there wasn't any sidewalk repair being done. So now we're in a situation kind of like with the street repaving, where we've got to bite off a little bit each year. And with the sidewalk repairs, we're also taking um, that incremental approach. There, there is also a five-year plan moving forward for sidewalk repairs. And uh, I believe um, this is, uh, we're going to, get, going to be going into year two of that plan. Thank you, Daryl. So let's talk about another topic that's not only important um, to Councilor um, O'Quinn, but I know it's important to you too, and that's transportation initiatives um, in District 5. And so, um, Daryl, you know what? This is your baby. I'm gonna let you quarterback this, bro. I'm gonna listen. Yeah, yeah, so. Uh, yeah. Matter of fact, this is, this is the caboose, so have at it. Yeah, so um, I've had the pleasure of uh, being very closely involved in a number of the initiatives that um, have involved our transportation system. Um, so just going through the, the slide here, uh, one of the things that um, predated me um, that for a long time, uh, folks have been asking for an alternative to paying with coins uh, for on-street parking. And so that project is now moving forward. Um, in addition to using coins, you will be able to use a um, smartphone app or dial a 1-800 number to, to pay for parking electronically. And so it's a, a layering on of options, um, not taking away the option of using coins. Uh, so that's something that we're really thankful for that we've finally been able to accomplish in the city, city of Birmingham. If you traveled anywhere around the country, uh, this is probably something that you've seen in, in other cities. So our constituents have definitely been asking for us to bring us into the 21st century in that regard. Um, the next thing I'll talk about is uh, scooters and bike share. So. Um, if you've been in downtown Birmingham in the past, you've noticed the, you've probably noticed the bright green uh, bike share bikes. Uh, that was the Zip Bike Share program. Uh, when that program was started, all of the funding was raised on the front end of that to bring it through five years. And during, well, when that started, it, it was a really state of the art program. It was the first bike share system uh, on this side of the world, I believe, um, to actually incorporate electric pedal assist bikes, bikes with a little electric motor in it that gave you a boost when you're you know, going uphill or um, uh, going a little faster. So um, that program came to an end at the end of 2019. And um, during the course of that bike share program, the business or, or the bike share has evolved and now there are now a lot of for-profit uh, companies that are um, doing bike share and also now electric scooters. So again, if you go to um, any other major metropolitan city in the country, um, you'll likely see what are called dockless bikes and scooters. And um, that is something that uh, with Mayor Woodfin's assistance, we have been able to move forward. Uh, we have put an application out for vendors to apply to operate here in the city of Birmingham. And I believe um, that we will be reviewing those applications and have actual scooters and bikes available to for people to use here in the near future. Um, one of the things uh, that's next on our list that I'm really proud of is the Birmingham On Demand project. Uh, we all know that public tra transportation has um, been especially challenging here in the city of Birmingham. And um, people have been begging for options, begging for improvement for as long as I've been here, and that's 20 years. So, and I'm pretty sure that 
um, the demand has uh, predate, predates that time. So at long last, uh, we do have another option and that is the Birmingham On Demand um, project. It is what, what is called micro transit, um, which is um, smaller vehicles and it's on demand so you can um, call or use a smartphone app to call for a ride. Uh, they usually arrive within eight minutes or so um, and take you anywhere in a designated geographic area, uh, which currently spans all the way from Five Points West um, to the Avondale area and um, the Fountain Heights and Druid Hills community down to uh, Five Points. So uh, about a seven square mile area and moving anywhere in that geographic area only costs $1.50. And if you have someone who's traveling with you, say a child, that person travels half price. So um, it has been extremely well received. Um, we were trending higher and higher each month in terms of rides uh, before the pandemic struck. Um, but even with uh, the current situation that we're in, there are still hundreds of rides every month, or every week, actually, um, that hundreds of people who are using this Birmingham on-demand service um, to, you know, get, get out and do the uh, essential things that they need to do. A, a big portion of the ridership is going to the MAX bus station downtown, uh, but also going to our uh, uh, hospital. So, um, again, that's something that we um, have, are very proud of and hope that we can continue moving forward. The next uh, item that is um, on our list is the um, bus rapid transit or the Birmingham Express. And um, the con that has project has been moving and construction is actually expected to start this fall and hopefully we can um, get it operating uh, prior to the World Games by 2022. I think the, the federal deadline for that project to be completed is actually in September of 2022. Um, but we have uh, once again the opportunity to uh, try and get that project uh, done in time for the World Games. Not guaranteeing that you know that'll happen, but uh, we got another crack at it. So um, the next topic on our transportation initiatives that I'll mention is something that I hear from pretty much uh, every block of every residential street uh, throughout District Five or wherever I go in the city of Birmingham, and that is uh, speeding. People are uh, uniformly concerned about the speed of traffic, um, especially in relation to their home. Um, so this is something that uh, I know, again, for as long as I've been in Birmingham, uh, folks have really been asking, you know, consistently, um, what can you do about speeding? You know, um, why don't we have uh, more speed humps or traffic tables in the city of Birmingham? So, with the change in administration and um, um, one of Mayor Woodspin's best hires, I believe, um, and James Fowler, the director of our Department of Transportation. Uh, he has really taken this issue to heart and is actually developing a protocol for us internally or the Department of Tran Transportation to uh, formally evaluate these requests and um, stepwise, you know, have a set protocol that we go through and evaluating those and, and actually um, creating some options for traffic calming or things that we can do to reduce speeding um, 
So this is a pretty dramatic change uh, relative to what has happened in previous years. Um, it used to be if you asked for uh, a speed hump, then um, the, the answer was simply no. No discussion, just no. And so we've had you know a really dramatic shift in that now, now not only are they considering it, but they're actually putting together a protocol for actually how to get these things done. And that, that protocol is actually expected to be uh, published on the city's website within the next 30 days. Darrell, that's, um, man, that's why we had you do it, because <laughs> uh, you're not only passionate about it, but you communicated the different transportation uh, updates um, to the residents of District 5, and probably there are other people around the city listening to this. So this conversation actually um, hits and touches all of us. So thank you so much, Daryl. Yeah. Um, so that is the actual end of our prepared update information. Um, this information will be available online. Um, I've just had a chance to look at the questions, and um, this is my first time seeing these questions. Um, they come from the neighborhood Central City, College Hills, Crestwood North, Druid Hills, East Avondale, East Lake, Five Points South, Forest Park, South Avondale, Fountain Heights, Gate City, Graymont, Oak Ridge Park, Smithfield, Southside, and Wyoming. These are all the neighborhoods in District 5. So the two things that I want to share with you. One is this, because of this format, any of you all came to the District 5 Town Hall meeting last year, you know that our normal format is when you ask one of these questions, there's probably about a 90% chance that I pass the microphone to uh, that subject matter expert, uh, that subject matter expert who deals in that issue every single day. Capital projects, um, um, streets, uh, PEP, community development, police, etc. Here I have a lot of questions that truthfully I am not able to ask because those people are not here with us again because of social distancing. And so if, if Errol doesn't mind, what I want to do is find a way to get every one of these questions posted and then allow me to get them to my team and get every one of them answered. And then we submit the question and the answer and make it available to you. Um, very similar to how we're making this, um, I guess, E-Town Hall available to you so you can actually get your question answered. Um, what I'm hesitant to do is ask your question out loud and then be in a position to tell you I don't know or I'll follow up because that expert in that various department is not here to answer that question. So, Dara, that's me off the cuff, literally looking at these questions. What do you think of that? Yeah, uh, you know, there, it can just generally tell you that looking over these questions, uh, a lot of them um, really focus on some of the issues that we have discussed. Um, structures that need to be de demolished, right. vacant lots, uh, code enforcement issues, um, trash, those types of things. Um, there are some, some you know, questions uh, that about specific topics Give me these um, that I, I can maybe offer some answers to. So, yeah, please do. Yeah, so um, one question here from Central City uh, is what is the status of the, the Powell School development? And um, for those of you who may not know, there is a historic structure at the corner of 23rd Street and 6th Avenue North uh, called the Powell School. And um, probably about around 10 years or so ago, there was a fire in that structure, uh, it partially burned and um, has really sat there deteriorating for a long time, even predating the fire. So it's something that I actually have to drive right by every time I come to City Hall. And um, so, so it's been in my face for the last uh, three years and something that I've actively been um, working on to try and get folks interested in, in improving that property. And what, one thing that I can say is that there's uh, the 
property ownership has um, changed hands recently, and there is um, a interest in redeveloping uh, that building uh, or restoring that building moving forward. So uh, hopefully that is something that we can see happen here in the near future. Of course, um, given the, the pandemic and all of its impacts on the economy, um, and the fact that we're still in that and don't really know the true impact of that, we um, will we'll have to see how we can come out on the back end of this as to whether that project or many others um, move forward. Um, so another example of a big um, redevelopment project, project that's in District 5 is the old Caraway Hospital uh, property. And um, just, you know, historically, I can tell you that that property had uh, somewhere around 90 different tax liens on it. So um, corporate realty has been in the process of uh, clearing up all those tax liens and getting the, the parcels all back in one piece. Uh, we have assisted through City Hall and, and um, using the tools that we have available to assist in that. Um, but as of last check, that, that project is moving forward. Um, prior to the pandemic, I know Corporate Realty was uh, looking at uh, doing demolition on some of the structures there and getting the construction underway as soon as possible. So um, look for updates on that. We have some other questions such as um, over in Crestwood North. Will the city look to making COVID-19 testing available for people who do not show symptoms or who are asymptomatic? Uh, the answer is yes, we've been at that for quite some time, but that is not uh, isolated to the city. And more so, um, what's our conversation with uh, the Jefferson County Health Department? And what's our conversation with UAB Health Systems, um, the people who are in the driver's seat driving the, the health issues in our community? And the city's question is, what um, support role can we play in assisting um, not only more adequate testing, uh, but to make sure that we can expand the options to test? Right now, you know, we can only test for if you are feeling sick, have a doc doctor's excuse, and or um, someone uh, that you may have come into contact with uh, has tested positive. But I am with you, I agree at a certain point, we should have probably been testing asymptomatic people a long, a long, a long time ago. And so I'm hoping more adequate testing comes available in the city of Birmingham, working with the city council, we'll continue to make ourselves available to our uh, local health community to see what we can do to um, spread the options of um, testing. Um, so I'll jump in here with yeah. another question um, from actually this one is from East Avondale and uh, the question is what is the plan for students moving forward especially for those without internet access or technology at home um, so I was recently reassigned to chair the education committee uh, the council's education committee and this is a topic that we have taken up through the committee uh, because um, like many of the other uh, disparities in the city of Birmingham, the pandemic has really exposed um, how our students, Birmingham City School students, um, lack some of the resources that may be found in other communities. And so, Birmingham City Schools actually surveyed um, or got about five, over 5,000 responses to a survey asking, uh, number one, uh, do you have access to the internet at home? And uh, the second question is, do you have an access to an electronic device um, at home? So of those, 5,000 plus uh, respondents, about 21% said they do not have uh, ready access to the internet um, at their home, and, and about 29% uh, 
said that they did not have a um, readily available electronic device uh, for students um, to use to, to do online learning. So that is, uh, those are numbers that are extremely significant and um, we're currently in a situation where um, we really want to, to fill that need and, and so uh, there is a active group in um, being led by Birmingham City Schools um, and that all of this information was recently provided in the Education Committee meeting which if you go to the City Council's Facebook page you can scroll back through uh, the timeline and find that um, committee meeting, the, the video from that committee meeting and, and, and see this information firsthand as it was presented. So um, again, there's a, a group being led by Birmingham City Schools. Uh, it involves a, a lot of different people, um, both who are in city government or city schools or um, in the private sector as well, but they're working to try and fill this need. So with regard to internet access, one of the things that's being looked at is actually providing the students um, that need interact, internet access with um, cellular mobile hotspots. So it's a little box that uses a cell signal um, and uh, you can connect a electronic device to it via Wi-Fi and have access to the internet. This is something, these cellular Wi-Fi hotspots uh, are something that the Birmingham Library has been making available for quite a while now. You could actually check them out through the library, um, but that is a solution that they are endeavoring to um, make available for city school students that need internet access. And with regard to the electronic devices, um, again, um, they are looking at um, uh, Chromebooks. Um, there's also uh, a proposal, um, I believe, from Apple um, for iPads, um, but the, uh, the Birmingham City Schools wants to have all the students who need those electronic devices and internet access. They want to have that fully resolved by the time school starts uh, in the fall. So. Thank you. An important question and one that we are, are closely following. Uh, Daryl, thank you for that update. Um, listen, um, I want to um, re-emphasize to you all that um, for the residents of District 5 and for all of our residents of the City of Birmingham, um, as it relates to us continuing to have to wear facial covers, it's really important that you protect yourself if you leave your home. Um, but I want you to remember, you do not have to go out here and purchase anything. Um, you can makeshift something from your home, uh, but just remember um, the, the, that we're still in a health crisis and the city of Birmingham is still under a state of emergency. And it's important that you protect yourself and your neighbors. And remember, this is about the community, not about you as an individual, but about we, us, our, and what we're doing collectively to protect each other. So thank you so much for that. Daryl, if you could, please give an update on some of the cool, um, I guess, festive-like feel going on over on First Avenue South? Yeah, so um, one of the things that's come about um, as a result of folks really uh, wanting to get out and exercise um, is we already know that Railroad Park is a very popular destination. You can go there just about any time, any day of the week and see lots of folks out walking, running, um, just out enjoying uh, the weather and uh, getting some exercise. And um, it's actually been the case that that's been such a popular destination that there's been some challenges uh, in, in creating the distancing that we need to uh, address the, the virus situation. So um, as a result, uh, one of the solutions that was created was to actually shut down um, First Avenue South uh, between uh, 20th Street and 12th Street um, to create a, a stretch of 
of street that is open for pedestrians and bicyclists and skateboarders and people who are on rollerblades or uh, whatever you, however you want to use it. But every Saturday and Sunday, um, they're closing down First Avenue South uh, adjacent to Railroad Park and making it available for for people to use and, and keeping the motorized vehicles um, out of that area so the pedestrians and bicyclists can be safe and don't have to be concerned about uh, cars. So that is something that um, we've really talked about uh, uh, quite a bit in the community over the years and um, just so happens that the uh, uh, COVID-19 situation has created the circumstances where um, the whole community came together, including the private property owners along that corridor um, to make that happen. So that's, it's been really fantastic. People have been taking advantage of it. So you can look for those uh, updates. Rev Birmingham um, in particular has been a important par partner in making this happen. And if you go to Red Birmingham's Facebook page, you'll see regular updates about that project. So Mayor Whitman, I'll kick it back to you. Thank you, Daryl. I'll make a couple notes. Um, one is a time check. Um, we're probably um, right at or close to an hour being together. And so unfortunately, um, based on this format we're engaging, uh, we don't wanna go over that because we wanna make sure we keep your attention. Uh, but there's another part of this that's very important um, Daryl and I believe in actual answering questions, even if um, sometimes the answer is not popular. And so because of our time, know that we will get these questions um, reviewed, um, to get them to um, the appropriate department head and the, the appropriate department, get you an answer and get it back to you. And so let me end by saying a couple of things. Um, the COVID-19 has, has, has had an effect on all of us. Um, some of us have lost um, family members, some of us a lot of friends and co-workers. Um, my way of life has been, uh, has changed, um, but I am proud of the resiliency that I see in this community and people taking care of each other and stepping up and putting community and others first. Um, and so thank you to you. Thank you to Dr. Darrell O'Quinn um, as counselor and representative of District 5. Thank you to each neighborhood president, each neighborhood vice president, each neighborhood secretary, for your sacrifice and volunteering um, to be a leader in your neighborhood. Thank you for each resident uh, for living on your block, your street, in, in your neighborhood representing District 5. Thank you to all the small business owners that make up um, and who do business in District 5. I know it's, it's been a tough time for you, so thank you for what you do. Um, the last thing I'll say is very simple. We have more work to do on behalf of the residents of District 5. Uh, thank you for being patient with us as a new administration. Um, being in our third year, um, there's still so much work to do, um, but we will continue to do that work of addressing the basic services, um, the city services, the infrastructure issues you have, and all the other things um, that are important to you, we will continue to address and solve every day. So thank you for allowing me to represent you. Daryl? Yeah, um, likewise, I feel blessed every day that I have the opportunity to represent the constituents of District 5. So um, I always try and take the opportunity whenever we have these town halls to let you know that I am truly thankful and um, really um, it is a tremendous honor for me to, to represent you uh, here on the Birmingham City Council. So thank you. Um, the other thing that I'll say is that you know, we are in difficult times. Um, business owners, um, folks at home who may have lost their job or laid off from their job, um, folks, you know, being challenged in education, being challenged to, to get basic needs taken care of. Uh, this is a tremendously challenging time for us all. Um, but one thing that I've learned from the Birmingham community is that whenever we have challenges are usually some of the most, you know, heartwarming moments uh, to see the community coming together to address those needs. 
I remember the response after the 2011 tornadoes. Um, it was tremendous and it went on for, for months. People volunteering, uh, providing uh, water and food and uh, taking care of all sorts of things for, for months on end. And so we found ourselves in a similar situation with an even greater challenge uh, now. So um, I just want to say, you know, have faith. Um, we will get through this, and the way we will get through it is the Birmingham community, the people of Birmingham uh, will show their generosity. We will come together to help each other, and um, so thank you for being a great city, uh, a city that we can all be proud of. Mayor Whitman? Oh, Darrell, that's a great way to close this out. Listen, everybody, be safe. Thank you for being a part of District 5. Have a good day. Have a good night. Good night.